Hello, I'm Dr. Marla Shapiro. I'm a past president of the North American Menopause Society, and today I'm joined by Dr. Cheryl Kingsburg. Cheryl, tell our healthcare practitioners who you are. Well, I am a clinical psychologist by training, and I have a division of behavioral medicine in OBGYN at University Hospital's Cleveland Medical Center. I think every OBGYN department should have a division of behavioral medicine. So I provide all of the psychological help to women with many women's health issues. So uh, GSM, uh, vasomotor symptoms, postpartum depression, sexual dysfunction. And that's where we're going to start. Okay. So let's talk about for our healthcare practitioners because this is often an area where there's undertraining and um, a discomfort because of the lack of training or lack of recognition of the prevalence of the type of sexual problems that exist in perimenopause and menopause. So is this a big deal? Is there a lot, a lot of going on or is this much ado about nothing? It's a huge deal and when you say some lack of training, let's just be clear, there is a lack of training. Unfortunately in medical school and in residency for OBGYN, for any women's health, there is so little on sexual function and dysfunction and yet every single woman that walks into your office absolutely wants to know that her sexual health will be addressed. They want it. They don't ask for it because they're embarrassed. They don't know if it's appropriate to bring it up or they think maybe it's a natural part of aging. But let me tell you that the highest prevalence of sexual problems occur in peri and postmenopausal women. Okay, so what are not necessarily a complete comprehensive list, but at least the top five or, or the ones that we really should be front of mind when we're seeing women in this period of their lives? I'll give you the top four, and then I'll tell you the two that are really most prevalent in peri and postmenopausal women. When we think about sexual problems, we group them into essentially four categories. There are problems with desire, wanting to want, problems with arousal, the ability for the genitals to uh, become physiologically aroused or the brain to be aware of that, problems with orgasm, and problems with pain with sexual activity. The two that really impact peri and postmenopausal women the most are problems with desire and problems with pain with sexual activity. Thank you, GSM. Okay, so if we have to put an idea of how prevalent this is for, you know, 100 women coming to see you, of the 100 women, you know, what's the prevalence? What can we expect? In desire problems, I would say at least 1 in 10. And for pain with sexual activity due to genitourinary syndrome of menopause, probably 60 to 80 percent. So can you repeat that number again? Because it's a big one. 60 to 80 percent. Right. So we don't do a very good job of this. I mean, there are many who are very well trained and comfortable in doing this, but for the average healthcare practitioner, seeing perimenopausal and postmenopausal women, often this is not part of the so-called functional inquiry, you know, on our list of things that we typically ask. So how can we encourage healthcare practitioners to ask or, or ask in a way that is not intrusive? Sure. Well, most of the practitioners I talk to will say, well, I don't ask because I have such a great relationship with my patient. If she had a problem, she would tell me, but not about this. First of all, most practitioners are so comfortable talking about things like smelly discharge, but when it comes to asking about problems with sex, all of a sudden they freeze up. So number one, get over it and start recognizing that sexuality is part of your health care and easy enough to say most women at midlife or at menopause start to experience problems with sexual activity. What concerns are you having or what problems are you having? That opens the door and if they're not having any, that's great. So, so really important I think for healthcare practitioners that what you've done is you've normalized the situation, you've let them know they're not alone, and then you've asked an open-ended question that isn't intrusive. That's exactly right. Because I think that those two tools to incorporate are the single most important thing that you need to do to be able to at least feel comfortable that you've made this a safe environment that's confidential for you to disclose something that you're not alone with. Absolutely. And please do not put your hand on the door and then ask with your head shaking, you don't have any sexual concerns, do you? I promise they don't. Right. 
So in other words, I'm leaving the room. I haven't prioritized this being high. I'm doing my job by asking the question, but your body language says, I don't really want to know. That's right. right. Okay. So the next question, I guess, is, is that once you've identified this, many healthcare practitioners and most women do believe there is no answer for my problem. Either this is aging or this is just put up with it because they've gotten that messaging somewhere along the way. Well, I hope your entire series of videos talks about empowering women because this is a huge area and sex and sexuality is really key for that. So there are answers and there are treatments and healthcare providers can truly help these women. So if we follow though, the plicit model that we use in healthcare, which says if you only ask and give women permission to address sexual concerns and then refer them out, you've already been a great help to them because that's all you need to do is ask and refer. But with things like genitourinary syndrome of menopause, we absolutely can treat pain with sexual activity. Local estrogen or local hormone therapy, pelvic floor physical therapy, um, sexual activity, use it or lose it, uh, lubricants and moisturizers, a little cognitive behavior therapy when there's been an anxiety about pain. Any and all of those are hugely helpful and you as the practitioner don't have to put a lot of time or energy into this and will save their sexual lives. And I think, you know, because medicine is always evolving, if you don't have an interest in an area, you're often not aware that in fact now therapeutics have evolved in this area as well. So there are new therapeutics for women. We're all comfortable with the concept of VVA, a subset of GSM. Everybody's, you got to know about that. If you're doing an internal exam, you can see it. You don't even have to ask about it. What about other therapeutics? Well, let's talk about desire, because we talked about GSM and the fact that we have a number of local hormone therapies and adjunct therapies, like I said, pelvic floor physical therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. But with desire, that's been later to the game to understand desire in women because it is really in the brain, um, and that is the wanting to want. And we have a number of therapies for that as well. First of all, cognitive behavior therapy has certainly been helpful in helping women and couples. But also we have two approved treatments, unfortunately only for premenopausal women, although studied in post, that are approved. And we have testosterone, which is unfortunately still in the US off-label, but we certainly have many uh, practice guidelines. We have the, the global consensus uh, paper that came out in 2019, and the ISWISH paper on, on practice, practice guidelines that support the use of testosterone for hypoactive sexual desire disorder in postmenopausal women. So we, we know how to dose it, even though it's off-label. We know that it works in many women. And unfortunately, so many practitioners really don't know about the treatments for low desire in women. So they say, oh, it's all in your head and you know, have a glass of wine. But really, women are desperate for help and again, all you need to do is ask and refer if you yourself don't want to be the one to treat. Right. So before I let you go, I just want to reiterate that most important part, that we are not all experts in everything, but we do have to be expert in opening the door in everything so that we can at least identify and then if need be, refer if we lack the comfort level. Yes, please ask. You can't treat a problem if you don't know it's there. And that is a great way to end. You cannot treat a problem if you ignore it entirely. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me.